Opportunities in African agribusiness with concrete examples. Once again, the moderator is Ken Jom, lead agricultural economist of, um, at the AFDB. We also have joining him on the panel, Jenny Van de Him of WUR, Charles Kwefiga, Executive Director, Uganda Industrial Research Institute. He did say he'll be able to share his own views later on today. You're welcome on the stage. We have Tony Mpoy, Grants and Internship Manager of Africa Lead. We have Eli Mwale, CEO of Glymo. And we have Michael Sudakasa, CEO, Africa Business Group. Please a big round of applause for everyone who is here today. Because they've all come from far and from near, but really more from far. And they all want to share their wealth of experience and knowledge. And um, please pay attention, ask all your questions, and get the best out of this next session. We should run straight into some 5.30, from where we'll then proceed for the cocktail. The cocktail is being held at the main building, but you step out to the terrace and you see the setup ready for us to have a nice time. It will be a heavy cocktail, so I doubt you'd want breakfast or dinner after that. So, heavy, all right? <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, obviously. Good afternoon. It's coming up. And welcome back to the last session for today. I hope you've all had a chance to have some coffee or tea and ready for this very important and hopefully very interesting and useful session for you all. So we have with us a distinguished panel that has already been presented. Um, and you will get to know more about them in the course of their uh, interventions or presentations. Um, and you will also have chances to uh, pose questions to them and seek clarifications on their presentations. So we will uh, have each of the panelists to make a short pitch this time to the agripreneurs instead of the agripreneurs pitching to them. You are going to tell them what you can bring to them, what advice you can give them and uh, what counsel uh, you can bring to them. And then at the end, we won't have cards for them to judge you, uh, but uh, they will take your wise counsel into consideration. And so we'll start um, from uh, the end um, with uh, Mike, who has already been presented to you. Mike is a, is a Harvard lawyer working from South Africa in the agribusiness space and has written uh, considerably in the business of agriculture. So he will make a short uh, presentation after which we'll pose a few questions and then we'll move to the next panelist. So, uh, Michael, it's over to you. Good afternoon. I've been introduced, but this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about an initiative. It's the key capacity development initiative of our company, Africa Business Group. And it is intended to help young agripreneurs who've been in business two to three years to actually accelerate the growth of their business. It's called the Global African Agribusiness Accelerator Platform. So we are, just to give context to why we created GAP, an African economic development company. We're based in Johannesburg, South Africa, but we are continentally active. We've been involved increasingly over the last five years in organizing continent-wide and international fora to develop transformation in the African agricultural space. The challenge that we saw was that while much of the discussion was about what needs to be done on the continent and many stakeholders were brought together, there were too few young people in participation. 
And it struck us that if the future of African agriculture is not in the room, we're not going to move very far. And we did start meeting some of the young agripreneurs, and we started asking them about how they are moving their businesses along. Where are they finding support? Where are they finding technical assistance? And there were a number of names mentioned, but they weren't all in a harmonious structure. So you may work with a project for two, three years. When the project's funding finishes, you are on your own. And so as a private company, we thought, well, we're intending to be around for a while. We'll develop an accelerated platform to create a community that we think is starting to be developed and we'll work with other stakeholders. So we are very pleased to be here at the inaugural AYAF. Agriculture and renewable energy are the two key focuses of our business. So GAP is based on really three pillars. It's based on helping enterprises develop their capacity and entrepreneurs to adopt technology. We believe that if you're trying to grow your business, understanding the technology that you need and being able to acquire that technology is a key step toward your ability to grow. The other area is finance and technical resource mobilization. It's critical, and many people who spoke earlier, the young people talked about access to finance. But understanding the value chain of finance, understanding what type of finance do you need. Do you need debt? Do you need equity? Can you get by with angel funding, friends and family capital? Those are things that, again, many young agripreneurs and entrepreneurs struggle to find information about. And so we provide uh, a training, if you will, and a peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunity in that space. The third area that we think is catalytic for growth is understanding how to access overseas markets and understanding how to access value chains. So trade and partnership is a key area. So we launched this initiative last December. We launched it at the Agco Corporation Future Farm in Zambia. One of the hallmarks of GAP is that we actually try and move young agripreneurs around the continent to where we feel there are centers of excellence. So in this area of mechanization and technology adoption, the new Agco Future Farm was a perfect locale. For the focus on finance, we partnered with Strathmore Business School in Nairobi, Kenya. Strathmore, in a few months, will be launching an agribusiness master's degree. And we thought, this is a great place and a great partner for us to have a discussion about finance, because also a lot of the impact capital, a lot of the capital for SMEs on the continent, the organizations are based in Nairobi. So it was easy for us to bring those colleagues to discuss with the young people who participated in our program. Our next program we're planning for Ghana. Again, we've been in Southern Africa, we've been in East Africa, and we want to bring the participants to West Africa. Uh, at some point, we hope to come here to IITA. We have a growing community, and I'm almost done. It's my last slide. Um, participants, and, and that's another hallmark of trying to bring the young delegates together from different parts of the continent. There's a lot of learning that can happen when you get together. I'm hopeful that you all will use this opportunity today and tomorrow to engage. We also have a number of partners, including uh, AIN and the African Development Bank, who are here, and we're growing that community. And so again, by participating three times a year, your budgeting uh, enabling, we're saying that that community that we're talking about developing will happen. Lastly, we've developed a magazine called the 21st Century Agripreneur. Um, one of the things that we think will encourage young people to get involved in the agribusiness space and the agricultural space is to read about their peers and learn more about their peers. Uh, we've had discussions with people about doing uh, other aspects of, of this, putting a, a YouTube channel, etc. We're in South Africa where you have one of the centers of media for the continent, bringing some of the agripreneurs more actively on television, et cetera. But the main goal is if I'm a young business person or I'm an unemployed business person and I see your success, I learn about you, I say, hey, but I can do what that person did. I went to school with someone like that person. 
I can replicate what they're doing. We don't have enough images, we believe, in broad media on the continent of successful agripreneurs. And I'm sure that's something that uh, Enable also will be working to do. And then lastly, uh, we're working with Rutgers Business School uh, because we want to deal with urban agriculture as well as rural agriculture because a lot of young people who are involved in agriculture we find on the continent are still predominantly based in urban areas, thinking about and moving between urban areas and rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, and thank you for keeping to the time. Um, please save your questions, jot down the, any comments you may have on the presentation, and we'll have time for Q&A um, at the end. Um, it is now my pleasure to call on uh, Eli uh, Moale from Zambia. Uh, many of you agripreneurs have shared your stories, and maybe you think yours is special. Um, here you will learn something different and know that you are not the only one to have been through this, and maybe you can learn um, from her story. So, Eli, it's over to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mine is very simple today because I think most of the people that have spoken have dirt on it. Um, I'll talk about working from markets into production. Grammar Enterprises is a, a commodity trading company that is trading into legumes and rice and sorghum in Sadak and uh, Komesa market. And I think if you look at the diagram behind me, uh, we have uh, orders, contract orders that we are targeting and we could not meet those markets. Because when we come back on the market, we found that there was no volume that can meet the demand that we first at the export market. And so we started working from market into production. And when we got into the seed companies, they told us we don't have the seed that we can give you because we don't grow um, open pollinated crops. Legumes are open pollinated crops. And so we found a challenge to meet the demands. And in 2015, 2013, 2015, we decided to work on the market analysis on the seed market on legumes. And uh, we gave birth to Future Seeds in 2015, uh, a company that is working on the seed. And our model is through contract farming. And we have 10 companies that we've engaged to grow seed, legume seed for us. And, and then that is at pre-basic level. And we worked with researchers to grow, to breed the seed for us in Zambia is the Zambia Agriculture Research Institute and working closely with the seed control and certification unit for quality assurance of our seed. And then uh, we have 100 entrepreneurs that are going to grow under the 10 companies, each company has to root 10 because we have a demand to meet at the end of the day. And then uh, at certified level, we have 1,000 farmers that are growing legumes and in the next year, will be able to meet at least 200 metric tons of each of those commodities on the export market. Uh, the challenges for the youth, future seeds is actually managed by my son and my daughter. Uh, personally, I grew up at a farm with my parents and I didn't do agriculture. I started social work and I'm a food production person in the hotel industry. So most of the issues that come out in terms of managing uh, challenges and mouth roles that youth face today and the space that youth are playing their games today. And I think some people talked about the social media. It has taken much of the time of our youth. Instead of going into innovation, they go on Facebook without actually adding value to the time that they're spending there. It's not understanding the intuitive awareness around them. 
and they always have empathy. There's no one supporting us. The government is not putting money for us. No one is investing in me. And I saw this in my own children. Uncertainty. Is there a future in agribusiness? Is there anything that can make me be called a director, a CEO, or someone wearing a jacket and move in front of people and demonstrate it can take place, it can happen? Uh, issues to learn, to listen, to question, and try to nature. There was a team that just passed talking about incubation, hard holding. It's very important. No one will force you to do it. If you're youth, opens up and gives you the idea what they want to do. It's very easy to help them, to nurture them, and to incubate them and give them what they need to be tomorrow. Emotional and spiritual intelligence is very, very critical. What does your inner person tell you you want to be 10 years or two years from now? What do you envision yourself to be? And at the same time, you would want to uh, express the natural human character you want to live you want people to perceive you to see you who you are and you want to love even when deep down your heart doesn't mean you really love those people and you want to learn to what extent do you consider the past the present and the future and project what you want to be after that and also leave a legacy who do you want to be remembered or what do, what do you want people to remember you of when you leave this world or when you move from one company to another? Okay. Ability to communicate effectively. Normally we have ideas, but we do not want to communicate the idea that people can help you put things together. Now, uh, this is the model. We realize that in business we work in networks. No one today will tell you I can do it all alone. There was an illustration of the value chain concept from the incubator uh, friend of mine in Ghana, in Uganda. It's really critical to have networks. And we realize for us, as much as we are looking at championing uh, multiplication of seed in our country, Zambia, and also in the region, uh, for your own information, Zambia alone imports 2,000 metric tons of legume seed each year. And that is a huge demand that no one can meet in the country. And when we were outside, we didn't realize that, but we came to know that. And we need to work with input suppliers. And input suppliers, these are breeders, I talked about the researchers. And we realized that even the researchers, there's issues of technology. And we work closely with the University of Zambia on technology and also research reports that would feed into the whole uh, value chain in the uh, legume production. We understand that productivity is an issue of uh, mechanizing agriculture. That's when you get the yield for production. There's also uh, issues of cash flows the bank has talked about. You can only exhibit that when they see the work that you're doing. It's very easy to access them. A channel of distribution through agro dealers, um, storage facilities, uh, community development, uh, because there are social impacts that come out of this our production at the end of the day in terms of man managing nutrition aspects from the legumes and also critical aspect of extension. I, I sat here and I had never heard anyone talk about extension. There's a lot of work that is required. I know you're talking about graduates from the university and you don't have anything to do. We need you in the agriculture sector in terms of extension. Capacity building. We need organization that are in capacity building to help manage the mindsets that we have talked about, manage to influence our policies and so on. Technology and insurance. When we started agriculture for us, some of us, these things never mattered. But today, technology and insurance is very, very critical. If you don't insure your crop, you lose it. And for us, this is where my children saw the opportunity to say, there's an opportunity for the youth in Africa, in Zambia, and Mamu can do it. I had asked to, have, to bring my son or my daughter to speak to the audience today and tell them the challenges and how they were able to manage them and how they are taking the lessons from our company. They would have done well to be here okay. to talk for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a round of applause for Ellie. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, story. And moving on, we now call on uh, Tony Mpui, who lives in Ghana, works for USAID, and will share the experiences of her work with us 
and uh, you can also note any comments or questions which you may have. So, Tony, it's over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm um, very pleased to be here um, this afternoon. I work for a program called Africa Lead, which is um, financed by USAID, implemented um, by DAI. And so what we do is a lot of capacity building in terms of improving food security outcomes for the youth. And in that, we've developed our youth and agribusiness entrepreneurship model. Mm -hmm. So really, I think in terms of challenges, in terms of collaboration with agribusinesses, we get a lot of youth, young startup entrepreneurs who come to us and who think they have an idea or who do have an idea, but they don't know how to, how to um, bring that idea to life and how to bring it to scale. And so really what we have kind of developed in our strategy is realizing that incubation is important and acceleration is just as important. And one of the main challenges that we've come to realize is that oftentimes you're coming from in a, a place where you're sourcing your young entrepreneurs with some ideas. You're trying to nurture the idea development and then bring that along into proof of concept. What people, the struggles and the challenges that agribusinesses have is that they don't know where they are in the spectrum. And so they're trying to move from idea development to market linkages straight away without developing an idea, without sustaining a proof of concept, without going through market validation. How do you test your product? Oftentimes you have young entrepreneurs who have an idea or product who think that the market wants it, but in reality they haven't even taken the time to test those assumptions. And then how do you get ready for investments? We also think that we can go from idea development build a nice, beautiful business plan, and all of a sudden, oops, we're investment ready. In reality, there are many steps to go through that. There are many steps to bring you from proof of concept to market linkage, and then to scale. And so that's really the strategy is at the heart of the capacity building that we do with entrepreneurs. As well as addressing some of these challenges, we've come up with our agribusiness inter internship program. And so really this is an internship program that's demand driven. A lot of um, students, a lot of youth come to us, they want these internship opportunities, but the supply is larger than the demand. And so what have we done? What have we done? We've started working with um, a number of small, medium-sized enterprises who tell us, listen, we have this and this challenge, we're looking for this type of student. And so we've designed two types of internship uh, categories. The innovation kind, where you give the student the opportunity to solve a strategic problem for the organization and also give them that opportunity to think outside the box. Where can I bring in my knowledge? Where can I be a value add added to the organization? And then we also have the more traditional type of internship where the um, agribusiness already knows what they need. They've outlined um, a number of tasks and the student can come and also um, um, contribute to that realization and bringing that organization to their strategic goals. Um, and so really what we're trying to do this uh, with this internship program is bridging the gap in terms of agribusiness learning. What we also have is that the intern comes out with problem solving skills and creativity. We work with, uh, we've partnered with a number of internship of universities in Ghana, for example, Asheshi University, Lancaster University, University of Lagon. Um, to kind of booster and also strengthen their career services uh, department so they can get these um, students ready to be successful interns. Um, and lastly, the last part of working with um, agribusinesses in, 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 in collaborating and addressing their challenges is we have a grants program for organizations who can help us go along the spectrum from incubation to acceleration and facilitate those types of needs and the resources that young entrepreneur, entrepreneurs need to go from idea development to um, sourcing and going to scale. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was a short end. You caught us all uh, off. 
So thank you again for, for that presentation. And we move now to, to Jenny uh, Vandermen, I hope I pronounced it rightly, um, who works uh, at the Wageningen University Research Group and has experiences both uh, in that group but also in Africa working on food security projects. So can you share with us some of your experiences and what lessons would you want to impart to some of the young agripreneurs um, who are here with us today? Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, sharing some of the experiences of Wageningen University and research. Um, we are based in the Netherlands and I don't know whether you all know where the Netherlands is located. But if you look at the, the map, the world map, you, you would hardly see it. It's just a tiny dot. But I don't know whether you all are aware that the Netherlands is the second exporter of agri-food products in the world after the United States. How did we do that? It's combining private sector with knowledge and enabling environment, working with the policymakers. So this is what we are also trying to do in the uh, university. Um, the university is a very international university and we are happy to host also many African students. From the 1,900 PhD candidates, uh, there are currently about 300 coming from Africa. And um, in our courses, we regularly also discuss with the private sector or those who would be interested to recruit um, the students who have completed their masters or, or PhD. And through those discussions, we have learned that we had to adapt uh, our curricula. We had to include entrepreneurship into our curriculum because um, the private sector said it's wonderful to work with all these researchers and they think they have this brilliant idea but they don't have a clue of what is out there when you start developing your business. So we did include that and um, I'm happy to write down a few websites. There's a massive open online course, there are short courses. Uh, we also have our own agribusiness incubator um, for those of you who want to know about the many, the number of startups and the capital, et cetera, et cetera, number of jobs that have been created, I'm happy to write it over there. Um, I, I think today has been a day where many people have shared very good lessons and, and very nice experiences that encourage us all that it is possible for the youth. And, um, also, I, I strongly believe what one of the panelists said earlier on, agribusiness in the Netherlands is money. Um, our university cannot cope with the increasing number of students. It's not because agriculture is sexy, it's because there's lots and lots of money in the sector in the Netherlands. And also those who come from abroad, 60 to 70% of our students come from abroad, it's because they see this business. We also have, so this is of course our experience in the Netherlands, but we take some of these experiences in what we call research for development programs. We have uh, set up with the private sector an agribusiness academy in Africa that is active in many African countries. I will share one example with you uh, or lesson that we have learned. Um, we all talk about mentorship, how crucial it is for the young entrepreneur. But have we ever asked ourselves, what's in it for the mentor? It's a crucial question. Because there are also mentors who may perceive you as a competitor. We have large programs in the seed sector development uh, industry. We have experience with uh, platforms, setting up platforms where stakeholders in a value chain that did not work 
because there were missing links in the value chain, if you organize them, again, in such a way that you respect also that there might be competitors, so you create that pre-competitive space where people can talk about issues in the value chain and where there is a challenge in a value chain, it means there's an opportunity for a business because something has to be solved. Um, talking about uh, legumes, yes, uh, certainly, inoculants. There's lots of people now in the business of inoculants. So um, the one last thing I would like to share with you is um, partnerships. Last year, I was in a meeting where at my left-hand side, um, somebody I didn't know was telling me about a program they had for startups, giving loans to startups in conflict-ridden um, countries, mainly in Africa, and that they were thinking about closing it down because they couldn't fill their pipeline. To the right-hand side, I was, you know, there was somebody saying that they couldn't get access to finance. So please, let's partner. I think this forum is an excellent opportunity for sharing positive experiences and negative experiences. Let's learn from all these lessons. Let's partner so that we don't only work for the, the privileged few, but we can promote seas of change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that intervention. And we'll move to the last, but certainly not the least of our speakers, Professor uh, Charles Kwesiga from Uganda, an industrial engineer, member of uh, several boards in Uganda, and whom you heard from um, um, earlier this morning. He will share with us some of the experiences in the Uganda Industrial Research Institute, uh, of which he's executive director, and from which we think some of the agripreneurs and some of the young um, farmers and uh, business people uh, can take some lessons uh, from. So over to you, Prof. Thank you. Greetings once again. Uh, earlier on, I read somebody else's statement. Now I'm here to talk about my own experiences. Uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity. As the moderator has indicated, I have been, been there, done that, and did what? I've been all over. I am uh, an industrial engineer of many years. I promised myself I would not reveal my age, but I'm sure as we speak, we are going to learn a lot more about, about old, how old I am. But uh, uh, I have been executive director of the Vienna Industrial Research Institute now for about 12 years. But the 12 years was a very interesting experience in itself. Because when uh, when Museven invited me back from my happy life in America, and I came back to Uganda after living in America for only 26 years, it was a challenge. But I'm happy that there are no regrets either on his side or on mine that I indeed came back. Uh, Probably a highlight of my, uh, my uh, career, especially this is for the youth, hard work is very rewarding. Because in 2014, in Copenhagen, Denmark, there's an association I belong to, or my institute belongs to, and that association called World Association of Industrial Technological Research Organizations, WITRO. Uh, it's been in existence since 1970. Uh, it has a membership of uh, over 160 member organizations from 70 countries, some active, some not so active. It boasts of organizations like Fraunhofer of Germany, a behemoth of a research institution, DTI, Danish Technological Institute, and so on. And on uh, 18th uh, October, 
uh, within September 19, 2014, they elected me their president, a boy from a peasant family from Africa, rising to that level in an organization of that magnitude. Young boys and girls, hard work pays. It was a very humbling experience. And the experience I got from there, are some of the things I want to relate to you today. Uh, and so, when I came back to, uh, to my homeland, I found the African paradox very much in place. Paradoxes. A continent with a lot of abundant resources, along with grinding poverty. Continent with a lot of people out of jobs, and they are, we are told they are unemployable. At the same time, we are complaining of brain drain. They are not employable here. How come they are getting jobs elsewhere? A paradox that even when you have democracy, security, political stability, your industry is not progressing. Even when government takes initiatives and policies, they're all well, very, articul well, very well articulated, very well written out, we end up suffering the law of unintended consequences. Only the wrong things happening. We have a high level of startups, but their mortality rate is high also. What we need is to turn these problems into opportunities. A, big, a lot of thinkers have talked a lot about that point. And I'm saying that yes, there are significant opportunities in our land, but these opportunities are laden with challenges. Let's turn these challenges into opportunities. Uh, I have lived to that uh, promised to myself, and so even the Uganda Industrial Research Institute, which I found as a dead institution, literally a dead institution, I, one time I was asking myself, how sane am I to accept this challenge? So there's no way I'm going to get this thing working. But in a few short years, less than 10 years, I was able to turn it around into a center of excellence, and I got President Uhuru Kenyatta to give me the accolades himself. Now, when you are recognized by a president of a different country, you know you have done something right. And so, uh, because when I say Museven gave me a medal, they say that's ah, because you went to the same school. That Uhuru I never met before. So, but that is what I am here to deliver to the youth that hard work pays. Real, real life examples. Uh, at one time, uh, in 2008, I was approached by a group of farmers who grow a lot of pineapples in the southern part, southwestern part of Uganda. And this guy was making wine. And his uh, processing room is that grass hut you see on top. His uh, uh, finished inventory was kept in his bedroom. We worked with him, and uh, in uh, 2015, uh, the president officiated at launching that new wine factory uh, in that same area. It is a success story. It can be done. Hard work pays. Uh, those of you from Uganda know about Lira and uh, how much they produce some the peanuts. We, Yuri has built that facility as part of its virtual incubation program. Hard work pays. These are, in southwestern Uganda, a covered area, there is uh, very scarce land. And yeah. so when somebody came up with an idea that uh, he could uh, engage his, uh, he, her community in mushroom growing and processing, I said, why not? Uh, what used to be uh, 
a small plot of empty land now boasts of that uh, mushroom training and resource center, uh, which also was opened in, uh, was launched in September of 2008. And now they have passed the test. Uh, they have met the standard required for the UK market. That is a success story in mushrooms. And so the stories can go on, but of course they are, uh, they, they don't have much time. So what I will say, uh, that's, uh, that's the president of the country and one of the ministers, the lady. That's me in the middle, next to another friend of mine, Dr. Nanturia, uh, who was my classmate at A-level. And uh, when I told him I'd come back to Uganda, he said, if you have gone to Uganda, I'm coming. He came and developed uh, a, a vaccine, a thermosable vaccine against the Newcastle disease. And now we have it launched and uh, piloted at Uganda Industrial Research Institute. And the next stage is to commercialize that as he works on other vaccines for other uh, animals. That is a success story. Again, one of our former schoolmates was at hand to do the honors. Thank you. What we have to avoid are bridges to nowhere. Kids, once you start projects, work on them to the bitter end. Governments are the only ones that are allowed to do this kind of work of bridges to nowhere. But individuals, entrepreneurs, organizations don't fall for that. This metaphor I got out of Cape Town. There is a tourist attraction, but it was not intended to be a tourist attraction. It was supposed to be a bridge which stopped mid-air. We have to keep to slow down from this practice of forever chasing a big brother. We cannot catch him. So what do we do? Turn our problems into opportunities and do what we have to do to industrialize and to uh, exploit the opportunities that are here. Way forward, uh, I'm we sorry, to, time is to, out. We have to yeah. wind up, thank you. But I end up with the knowledge required. This is a quote from Kofi Annan. The knowledge required to create wealth is not lacking. What is lacking in sub-Saharan Africa is the will to turn this knowledge into practical innovation. Let us keep going. Thank you very much. Uh, wise words from uh, a man who's done the journey. Thank you again for sharing uh, that experience. And ladies and gentlemen, that was the intention of this panel. We had the young people present their ideas, but we now bring you also people who have resources and also stories to share with you. So we will now move to the probably just as exciting part of this uh, session, where you have an opportunity to um, pose your questions and uh, seek clarifications from this eminent panel. But uh, I will start a ball rolling by uh, maybe um, getting some um, clarifications or points in, uh, especially to, to, to Tony, because you are giving grants. And I'm sure every day you receive hundreds and thousands of grants, just like the agripreneurs are also submitting proposals. So, and I know most of them you probably throw out of the window, some you throw in the trash. So what makes a good proposal and what are some of the really bad ones you have seen come across your desk recently? Um, thank you for that question, which um, I get a lot. What makes a good proposal and what makes a, a bad one? I, I don't, well, first of all, when we do receive grant proposals, it's, it's a committee. And so a good proposal is usually unanimous. Um, in terms of um, funding for agribusiness support, really, I think what makes a good proposal is that you have to understand where your organization is and what are the resources that you have to help an entrepreneur move from one of the steps that I was mentioning earlier, which is um, idea development to proof of concept, 
to market validation, um, investment readiness, and then market linkages and going to scale. And so a good proposal is one where um, the, the grantee, potential grantee, knows exactly where they're trying to go and that you can see sustainability or that this award, grant award, is going to be used and leveraged as seed funding for that agribusiness to take it to the next level. Um, and oftentimes, I think we confuse taking it to the next level with bringing um, an idea, a business idea, to scale. Taking it to the next level means knowing where you are in terms of setting up your business and what type of um, management support you need. Okay. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Let's move to um, Ellie. You proposed um, contract farming as one of the ways in which you are trying to grow your business or you are engaged in. But you know contract farming has a mixed reputation. The pros and cons, there are uh, dangers. What have you in the Zambian experience uh, uh, what has been your experience in Zambia uh, rather uh, with contract farming um, to grow your business? Thank you so much. Um, contract farming is not something that you can just inherit. I think I had to take time to study contract farming I, online and I was uh, supported by the Peruvian government to go and do and feel and get connected to contract farming in the Peruvian uh, agriculture system, which enhanced uh, my work in uh, Grima Enterprises, which uh, Future Seeds has adopted in um, bringing out the opportunity area that I mentioned, that circle, realizing that um, as a company, we do not have extension services in belt in the company. And so we need to work with uh, government extension services. We need to work with civil society organizations that are in agriculture to help us manage the, the groups of farmers that we work with. And uh, contract farming helps also to manage issues of site selling, issues of loyalty, because you do not uh, work on uh, loose ends like outgrower schemes. We work with local leadership of the communities the headmen, because we know land in Zambia, 90% is traditional land, 10% is state land. And for any smallholder farmer to be able to cultivate the two hectares minimum that we put up for anyone that comes on the contract farming, they need the support of the lo local leadership. And also, uh, I talked about warehousing, there are challenges with storage facilities. So the local leadership will help us to put up what we are calling bulking centers. And because there is loyalty of these members in the community to their local leadership, so they tend to avoid side selling and also ensuring quality uh, and so forth. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that experience. Uh, moving on to Michael, you talked about the platform you're creating and some of the training opportunities. But as a lot of the agripreneurs here will tell you, um, after all of that is done, they need finance. So what is your institution or your group doing to help either provide the finance or to steer the agripreneur to be able to access finance? Can you hear me? Thank you. I think one of the biggest things, and if you looked at the first slide that was on Ag Africa Business Group, we work in economic development but also provide business development services. So in addition to being a commercial attorney, in my past I've worked in corporate finance and a little bit in private equity. Understanding how to present one's business on paper and how to articulate that business in person is a developed skill. It's not something that you just wake up knowing how to do. And so what we're trying to do with GAP is provide a smaller forum Typically, we have 25 to 30 delegates. Overall, we may have up to 60 people, but those are the mentors and the speakers who come. And we challenge and work with the young people to present 
First off, their best presentation of their business. Then we have mentors look at what they've presented and give them critique in that. On the finance side particularly, one of the biggest challenges is that most people know brand names, but they don't know anybody in the financial institution. There's not someone that they specifically have a business card for who they can engage and say, here's my idea. Does it fit your criteria? What do I need to do to improve it? So earlier this month, the 4th and 5th of April, we actually had our finance workshop. And we brought 15 different financial institutions in a setting with 30 young people. And the people sat and listened and talked uh, with the young people about what services they provide. We helped them again identify what is the right type of finance that you need. People often think, I'll go to the bank. The bank is not always the best place to go for your financing. So we brought lease financiers. We brought impact financiers. We brought micro financiers. We had the African Development Bank come and talk about the range of programs that they offer. And I think starting with that education, um, it helps an agripreneur be a better finance consumer, if you will. And when they articulate, and the point was mentioned, you need to know where you are in the chain. When you can articulate that well, finance is always looking for opportunity. So the financiers will pick up on someone has a good idea and they're grounded and they would like to move forward. So creating a platform within a midst, and again, we try and also identify institutions who are providing services. TechnoServe is one, AgroPro Focus is another, Grasha Michelle Trust has a program for women entrepreneurs and agripreneurs. And we bring them together because we feel like we'll provide part of the solution, but there are others who can provide other parts of that solution who we want to expose the young people to. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that uh, explanation. And I think we should also say that at the African Development Bank will soon be establishing a fund for African women um, businesses called AFAWA. Um, the bank is going to put, I think, 30 million to try to raise 300 million for African women businesses, including women businesses in agriculture, um, of course. Um, so thank you again for that uh, explanation. And uh, moving on so we can give the audience an opportunity to also interact, let's just uh, have the last two. And Jenny, uh, I think we were all struck by the point you made about uh, Holland being the second largest after the US. And even though you're small, and a lot of that is due to innovation. And, uh, and, and, you, and you said, so thank you for that. So I don't have a direct question for you, uh, neither for the professor, but I'm sure some of my colleagues um, have. So we will take um, questions, one at the back, two the front, um, third here, and fourth behind the microphone. And please state your name, and uh, if the question is directed at any of the particular panelists, you can do so. The gentleman at the back first, please try to get to a microphone. Thank you very much. Sanus is my name. Um, my question goes to uh, the USAID um, speaker, and maybe any other person wants to add to it. I think one of the issues that startups like us have been facing, and majorly discussion around whether funding uh, should go to startup to subsidize them and all of that, are uh, really telling on us about to what extent we can scale up. So my direct question is on strategic partnership. How can startup leverage on strategic partnership so we can have, for example, uh, a guy like me who has started uh, a project or who is running a company has opportunity within the network to connect with existing bigger players and be able to uh, either work together uh, innovatively to have, I think, uh, a kind of strategic partnership. Okay. So I think, uh, yeah. All right, thank you. The next question is the gentleman in the white shirt in there. Please put your microphone. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, my name is Apollo Segewa. I manage uh, Churat, a leading agribusiness in Tibet in Africa. Um, based in Uganda. Uh, my question actually goes to the moderator regarding Africa Development Bank. 
oftentimes we get involved in these kind of uh, conferences and seminars where we share a lot. And a lot of uh, us who come through share what we're doing, just like we've been doing the whole day. What happens is we rarely have government part of this, these meetings. But when uh, African Development Bank or quite a, a, a big number of the development partners come to our different countries to roll out programs, they go to roll these programs out through government. And government doesn't know the players who are experienced and knowledgeable in actually getting these programs going. It keeps us, the people on the ground who execute programs, in a rather awkward situation. Uh, just to give an example, World Bank comes to fund an intubation program in the country, and this for the fact that the only intubators in a particular country are well known by everyone, say, across the continent, it ends up with working people who have never attended a single intubator training and completely don't know what to do. So my question to you is, how are the development agencies and the uh, African Development Bank going to approach issues about implementation on the ground and the players that are supposed to be involved or know how to roll out programs vis-a-vis -vis going through government that rarely attends conferences like this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think your point is uh, well taken. Um, we will ask Omo Tere to reply to that at the end. She's young, she's in the African Development Bank, and she's working here in Nigeria. So she will tell you how the bank operates in terms of financing um, individual private sector uh, operations. We had a third question from the right. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sanwini Bagise. I'm from the bank IFDB. I have a question for three panelists, for Mr. Michael Sudakasa, Mr. Mrs. Eli Mwale, and Mrs. Charles Kwesiga. The successes they presented were very interesting, but I wonder if uh, I asked them to cite just one of the key partners they have, the one with that who they could not succeed in the initiative, who will it be? And what was your strategy to secure this partnership? Thank you. Very uh, direct question, and uh, we hope we'll also get a very straight and short, direct uh, answer. So we had a fifth, which was the gentleman behind the uh, camera. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Godfrey from Acumen Fund, and my question goes to the lady from Zambia. In the seed business, how did you overcome, or what methodologies did you implement to overcome adoption risk and even farmers' ability to pay? Usually their cash flow is limited at the planting season because they've harvested and sold. How did you go about uh, tackling adoption risk and ability to pay? And uh, just a side question to Michael. Uh, I don't know if there's any strategy why uh, there's no African university involved in any of your programs, because I seem to see Strathmore and Regas. And I think uh, most of the people here are alumni of African universities and maybe, you know, on the ground experience. Is there any particular reason why we have not seen any African institution? Okay. Um, we'll give the panel a chance to react, and then after we'll come for the next round, and starting with uh, Madame Yapi, uh, who will probably be speaking in French, so it will give you time to get your earphones up. So um, we'll start with the last one, Michael, and then we'll work down, and you can uh, respond to any of the comments uh, which are directed to you or in general. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, two questions posed to me. One was key partner, and then the second one, which is actually, to me, kind of related, um, the dearth, in initially at least, of African institutions on the list of key partners. When we started our initiative last December, 
like many of you in the room, and some of you have older businesses, so it might not be that uh, fresh in your mind, we were a startup in developing Accelerator. So we went to a laundry list of stakeholders, many African and others from other parts of the world, seeking support, financial, technical, et cetera. And so the first one that said, yes, we think you have a very good idea, was a company called Agco Corporation. Uh, we serve as the program director for an initiative called the African Green Revolution Forum, which is in its 10th year now, and we, for the last four years, have served in that capacity, and we worked with Agco. Agco had just launched their future farm in Zambia, and we were aware of it from 2014. And what we thought of was, you don't want an institution like that, and I spent $30 million or something like that, to be a white elephant. And that happens at different times. If people don't know about the facility and they don't know about what can be done there, they don't attend. So they gave us the venue uh, without paying for it, and that was a big plus um, to get started. I have them at 50%. The other person who's at 50% is actually sitting to my right, uh, Ellie Mwali, because Ellie is a longtime friend, but I said, Ellie, I'd like to do this in Zambia do you think that we can get government to come? Because I agree with the gentleman who mentioned you need government in the room. And we were able to have the vice president of Zambia come and inaugurate GAP, and that changed the whole complexion of that exercise. So that was one point. So it's a 50%, 50%. The second one, though, in terms of African institutions, we, I'd say it'd be too new an initiative to say we haven't done that. We are now in the process of talking to some of the stakeholders, and this is by demand, of having gap country programs. Because what we're doing now is around the continent, but there are people, the Zambians, for example, the Kenyans when we left, that said, but we'd like to do all three modules in our country. We cannot do that without partners here. So in that regard, we appreciate the opportunity to have the platform to introduce the program to more people, and we're definitely looking to have uh, partners on the continent. It really can't be done. And when I say it, it's the development of a cadre of a thousand, two thousand successful African entrepreneurs around the continent. Um, that will only come through partnership with our continental institutions. Thank you. Ellie? Uh, okay. I've got it now. I've got three questions. Uh, there's one on adoption risk, uh, and uh, one on the, um, the partners and the strategy that we used. Uh, as I already indicated, uh, I have Grammar Enterprises, and Grammar Enterprises has been making presentations under NEPAD Business Foundation. And uh, when we had challenges on the market to meet the demands and the time frame, because Lusaka is not an agriculture city, we do agriculture outside Lusaka, and so we had to work around it to, to get the volumes in time and meet the targets. So we developed a project called African Food Basket. So I believe with the past speakers that together we can do it. It's a, a, an ambitious vision to feed Africa and to feed the whole world. And within that, we have three strategies pre-production, post-production, and production. Now, when we did this project, the first person that got in contact with us is uh, Grasha Masheo. And uh, we developed this concept together with a colleague of mine in Malawi, Grace Mijinga Muhango. And she called us to the table and said, ladies, I, I think I believe in what you're seeing. Can we work together? But she didn't have any other finance to, to finance that project. And uh, one day we met um, a project called Vuna with the support of the DFID funding. And at that time, we had already uh, established the seed company. And my colleague in Malawi also had a, has got a seed company and a commodity company at the same time. And they said, look, you are talking about legumes, and legumes are drought-resistant crops, and we are looking at issues of climate change. I think if you go outside 
uh, the registration table. I brought some materials there that I've displayed outside for you to get more information with our partners. We are working with VUNA, and VUNA is a UK support fund, uh, which is supporting drought-resistant crops on legumes. It's a two-year pilot. They are also piloting to see uh, how legumes can uh, be adopted at, uh, at regional level, at country level, because it's a regional project. It's called Gender Transformative Regional Seed System. And so those are our partners. Okay. And uh, in terms of adoption, we understand that legumes are open pollinated crops. But what drives us is the volumes that are indicated area at market level. We have an integrated market system within the value chain. So we control the, the seed and we control the markets because we have the market of the grain at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, Tony, um, any uh, comments on this first round of questions you may want to respond to quickly? Hello? Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I think I got on this side was um, how can startups build strategic partnerships to further their um, startup initiatives, correct? Um, I think that one of the key concepts about partnerships is it's a partnership because it has to be, first of all, a win-win for both partners involved. And you also have to be going in the same direction. And so really, when we talk about partnerships, we're talking about leveraging. What are you bringing to the table? How can you help me get to this next phase? And how can we help one another together um, move towards a common objective? Um, I think in terms of um, agribusiness startups, you're finding your, your key partners, you have to recognize where are your uh, strengths and your weaknesses across the value chain. And so if you're in the um, production link of that value chain and you really don't know where to go in terms of, let's say, uh, distribution or marketing um, or R&D, then that's where you need to know, okay, where is the missing link? Where is my, where am I that I need to strengthen um, my ability to be able to move across that value chain and get my product to the market. So that would be my recommendation in terms of making your best strategic partnerships. Um, thank you. So um, analyze your value chain and see where you can get strategic partners first. Um, Omur Teret, do you want to respond to what can the African Development Bank do um, in support? Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, as the African Development Bank, we are bound by some sovereign rules of the countries with which we uh, operate in. So um, we can't design or create projects without engagement of the stakeholders. So as part of our project design and preparation, we typically engage with the stakeholders, especially the private sector for the agriculture products uh, projects to really understand the realities and develop solutions that can accompany them along the way. So um, contrary to um, the, the idea, we, we, we really do spend a lot of time engaging with the players in the countries to determine the best solutions we can adopt for them. Thank you. Thank you. And also just to allay your concern, because maybe we don't see too many government, permanent secretaries and, I don't know, directors of agriculture in the room, um, we wanted to give this space to young people themselves. Um, to express and to develop. But whatever recommendations come out of this meeting will help formulate whatever programs the bank will deal, uh, will formulate with uh, the country's uh, concern. Well, we didn't want this meeting to be swamped by government people, but to give private young people the space to develop their own projects and ideas and come up with their own recommendations. Thank you. So um, we will do a second round of um, comments, and uh, we'll also give the prof and uh, Yeni time to react. Uh, this is one of the workshops where you cannot say you didn't have time to ask questions. Usually, you go to these panels, they ask three, four questions, sorry, time, now, next panel. So you have all the time to express yourself, to ask all the questions you want, so that we can get the best out of you uh, to take forward. So we will start first with Madame Sandrine, and then the gentleman behind him, and then the third will be the gentleman here. And uh, 
fourth will be the gentleman in the green shirt. So, Madame Sandrine. Merci. Euh, ma question, c'est pour la dame de la, des Pays-Bas plutôt. J'aimerais qu'elle nous fasse un petit partage d'expérience sur euh, comment ils ont trouvé des solutions pour euh, l'inadéquation entre la formation et l'emploi dans les entreprises, c'est-à-dire les jeunes, euh, les, les, les élèves et les étudiants qui sont formés. Euh, les formations qu'ils reçoivent à l'école ou à l'université ne répondent pas forcément aux besoins des entreprises. Comment est-ce qu'ils ont trouvé euh, des solutions pour pouvoir pallier à ce problème Merci. The question that you and Jenny would probably be best, how do we make sure that the training that you are going to give will be in line with what the market needs? So in other words, even if you are doing an incubation or you are trying to bring these young people and impart some value chain, how do you make sure that this is in line with what the market wants and do, so that there is no uh, problem of, you know, where you train the person and then uh, the market doesn't require their skills? So, Stand by to give some response and what you think about that. Uh, we'll take the next qu uh, comment, which was the gentleman in the green, I believe, on the left. If not, we'll move forward to the gentleman in the white. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My question is to Mr. Michael for the Global Agro Business Group, an African um, business group. I was actually invited for the program in Kenya, but I couldn't make it uh, due to some reasons. Uh, number one, it was the first um, uh, form of exposure to the type of work you do. And it was difficult for me to make a decision to sponsor myself for the, for the program because I was finding it difficult to approximate what I was going to expect from the program and my putting my resources into it now that is the background for my own question that is it possible for your group to have some form of engagement online such that some of us who are in our that phase of our business which is and we actually need to accelerate our businesses if there's a way we can engage with your group without necessarily uh coming to a particular uh um room to, to get that knowledge passed across because there are some leverage that could be extracted from that process. Uh, being in business for some years and we're in need of acceleration, we can actually understand some basic language which we can pass online and be able to get that needed um, um, advice even before getting into a room to, to access such information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman. Well, I try to get you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my thank questions you. to Professor Kwesige. Uh, I think you've been a part of this particular process of involving young people into agriculture since the beginning. And uh, my question is actually uh, a question of uh, asking if, uh, according to your experience, uh, wisdom and avoiding actually the, the, the bridge to nowhere. Uh, I remember in Nairobi uh, some time back when we were discussing about uh, uh, engaging young people into agribusiness and today we are still actually uh, rotating around the same themes. Uh, do you see really uh, the fact that we are having young people like my, my, my sister from Rwanda who is 18 years old sitting together in the same platform at the same table with the professor of your age, your experience as a good indicator that actually we're on the right track, uh, is it an indicator that actually we are doing it rightly, or we will be facing same problem that actually building bridge to nowhere? That I want to hear from you, uh, the way you are seeing actually the revolution towards the uh, 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 African agriculture uh, revolution by young people who are actually being active and taking the read. Thank you so much. Okay. Not sure if it was a question or a tribute, but I'm sure the prof will, <laughs> will respond. So we have the gentleman in the green in the front, and then the gentleman of the hat at the back, and we'll try to take one or two at the back there as well. So quickly, and a direct question, please. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to mention here again that um, when we talk about agricultural financing, I know there are issues both on the supply and the demand side. Uh, I represent the supply side, and uh, I know one of the questions that, uh, that is bogging the minds of youth is that 
having said all this with all the innovation, who will finance us? That is a big question. And we must address what are the issues, why are they not getting financing? And if we don't address that issue, uh, even when we go out of this uh, place, we might still have the same uh, problem. Uh, I represent the Bank of Industry, and that is a development finance institution in Nigeria. Uh, the fund to give out to youth, I can say that that is not a problem in Nigeria. The issue is, can you give out fund and get it back as a financier? Because you must remain in business. And one of the problem, one of the issues that I think we must address as a country is that we must build our financial system to the point where you, everybody must be a responsible borrower. That the times where you can borrow and just go scot free when you don't pay back should be over until that sanity is in the system. The supply side will continue to have restrictions in giving that credit. Other um, uh, clients like Japan and um, Brazil, they have this credit supplementation system. We have, they have this credit guarantee scheme, which is not that available in most African countries, where people can get credit guarantee, uh, guarantee for loans that they get from either commercial bank or development uh, finance institution. In Africa, if you don't have landed properties, you cannot access credit. So this is a big challenge. and. Uh, development finance institutions like African Development Bank, Bank of Industry, and the government sh have to look, CBN have to look at this because okay. this will, is what we open the financing space for Africa finance. Yeah, thank you, and we, we fully agree. Um, in fact, for, for us at the bank, we have established a, a completely new department called uh, Department for Agricultural Finance, whose job is precisely to address some of the issues you have just uh, touched upon. So we had the gentleman at the back with the hat, I believe, right here hat. If not, we'll move to the lady at the back. Yes, please. OK, thank you. Uh, I am lady at the Jim. back, sorry. OK, behind me. Yes, oh, okay. and then after. <laughs> Je suis Sandrine Obama du Cameroun. Je représente une coopérative qui fait dans la transformation des produits agroalimentaires au Cameroun. J'ai une question, j'ai une question à deux volets pour la dame d'Africa euh, Quel est le profil qu'un stagiaire classique doit avoir pour bénéficier de vos services et accompagnement? Et le deuxième volet de ma question est, quelles sont les étapes qu'un produit doit suivre avant de se faire vendre Merci. Direct questions, mais c'était adressé à qui À la dame de Africa Lead. De Africa quoi Seeds. Seeds, c'est ça. Oh, ouais, ok. All right, all right. Exactly. So you got the question All right, thank you. Um, the gentleman who was, whose place you just took, you can ask your question now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Bola Jige from Nigeria, and I'm a fish farmer. Okay. You were talking about uh, the lady from uh, Zambia. You were talking about um, the difference between contract farming and uh, grow out farming. And I just needed clarification on that because we, we practice something uh, like this. Uh, you give people. Uh, fish, you give them feed, you also provide the facility for them to grow, and when they finish growing, you just take the fish off them and remove your input and let them have um, the profit, so to say, or you share the profit one way or the other. But the point is, the facility is yours, the fish is yours, the feeding is yours, because I'm a fish farmer. Now, is that what you call contract farming, or I just needed a clarification on that? Thank you. Let's have one last question so that we can give the panel also time to react. Yes, the gentleman, um, put your hand up. Okay, thank you. My name is Abraham from Ethiopia. So my company works with smallholder farmers by providing mechanization and input service. My question and appreciation goes to Michael. 
I have a privilege to attend one of the GAP session in Kenya, and it's uniquely designed to address agripreneurs. And my question is, uh, what efforts are undergoing uh, in your side, Michael, to connect the uses of uh, the GAP fellow with uh, uh, investors or financer and other universities or institutions to make, to make them uh, in a better position? Thank you. Can you repeat the last part of the question again? What efforts are undergoing uh, from GAP side to connect users with uh, financer or other uh, financing institutions and universities to capacitate them further? Got it now? Yeah. All right, so, so we'll uh, get a response from the panel and we'll start with the professor. Uh, uh, and then we move down the line. Uh, okay. As we go uh, along. Earlier on, there was a question about partnership. The lady out there. Yeah, sorry. What was your question again? Sorry, I was asking who is the key partners of the institution and what was the strategy to secure the partnership with this okay. partner? The, uh, that's right. Uh, of course, we have two types of partners. There are those who are our benefactors, and there are those who are our beneficiaries. Either way, you are lucky if you get a partner who is enthusiastic and knowledgeable. A lot of times, you are never lucky enough to have both. Uh, we can start, say, with... Uh, if you are to draw a matrix of uh, a, uh, knowledge, intellect versus uh, enthusiasm, you find that, uh, say, the elite types, they are knowledgeable, but their knowledge is their own. They are not sharing with many. If you go to the other extreme, you have a lot of people who are very enthusiastic, but all they have to offer is fantasy. They talk a lot, but they have no idea what they are talking about. Then you have those who have neither. They are neither enthusiastic, nor are they knowledgeable. What you want is a combination of both. It doesn't matter whether it's a benefactor or a beneficiary. For the beneficiary, uh, if they are enthusiastic, they can be trained to know more about the idea they are, they are espousing. But that's usually uh, how we approach uh, how we approach the whole thing. Now, as far as the benefactors are concerned, and this alludes also to a question that uh, I think Apollo posed about uh, dealings with uh, benefactors who come to government and end up picking uh, people are not very, very useful to deliver on the project. Uh, the, the tendency, of course, is that ben, uh, development partners tend to gravitate towards government because government is in charge. Uh, you will not get uh, a grant or, uh, or a loan without uh, Minister of Finance folks presenting the case to the Parliamentary Committee on National Economy to approve these things. And so what that, that, that has led me to draw a following conclusion that technology, which is my field of special interest, is comprised of two types of people. Those who manage what they don't understand and those who understand what they don't manage. And so the decisions on whether I get funding rests with some economists and other, maybe even lawyers, maybe other, you know, everybody except those who understand the technology. Uh, that also is very well manifested in the, in the budgeting process. How do they allocate? Do they reflect the government uh, priorities or the country's priorities, not even government priorities, 
What does the country need? Uh, so, the, uh, how do you make sure skills are relevant? That's a very tough one. Because industry requires three pillars for it to succeed. Appropriate technology, skilled manpower, and affordable financing. If you don't have any of the three, it's like a three-legged stool. It will not balance. So skills is a very critical component. But a lot of places, a lot of African countries, their curricula in education is not going to deliver the skills that you really need in industry. So a lot of times we have to actually retrain even engineers. Find a, a mechanical engineer with a first class honors degree, and he comes to our workshop, which is not really too fancy, and they are looking at an engineer for the first time. But the book knowledge, first class. And so we have to work towards changing that at whatever level we can. Uh, I have been engaged in uh, uh, developing. Uh, a petroleum studies institute in Uganda, and I know what I've been going through, but we're making progress. Recently, I started a new model, and I think this is something that uh, you, should, you guys should think about. Uh, I looked at Kenya's success story with the hotel industry because of Utali, and I don't see why we cannot replicate that experience, that model, where when you are training people, you are also giving them the opportunity to do apprenticeship, especially for technical, technical skills. Because Kenya's uh, hotel management uh, facilities have been very successful. Kenyans are literally running every hotel that uh, has some uh, recognition and some good rating. And that's because Utali College has a training facility attached to a five-star hotel. So the people who come off that campus hit the ground running. Anywhere else, they train them, then they go to learn on the job. Nobody has that kind of patience. So I'm asking, I'm, so I've now negotiated with Chinese who are giving me, a, who have given us a grant of $30 million to build a similar model as Utali, but focusing on machining and manufacturing so that you have machining and manufacturing classroom orientation. Attached to that is a production facility. Together, they produce the technician you need. Okay. Uh, Agribusiness and youth, it really depends heavily on uh, the program design. Uh, again, you want a youth who is not a uh, single dimension in their orientation towards business. It's a big business mistake we make. An economist believes is the answer to industry. Uh, a scientist believes the same way. Uh, you, know, you must, it, industry is multidisciplinary and they must take a holistic view of business. You are not going to succeed just by learning the skill on how to run the business. They must also understand all the other attendant uh, disciplines that they need. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And uh, maybe, uh, Yanni, you can share the example uh, from, from Wageningen, how you successfully take the university, the, the, the products, and get it to private sector and get the businesses to do it, and uh, what we can. Thank you. Um, actually, that's not how it works, um, because uh, we always, it's private sector that is always in the lead. So it's not that we develop something and take it to the private sector. Um, so the way it works in the Netherlands is that we do not have core funding for our research institutes. Our research institutes, it's 100% contract farming. So, uh, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, contract research, <laughs> getting mixed up with the contract farming here. Um, so that means if we want to apply for research funding, the private sector has to be part of it. And most often they have to be in the lead. So that already ensures 
that whatever you co-create is going to be adopted. So that is one. Now for the university to deliver uh, students who have the right qualifications for their future employers, um, it is essential that you have discussions with them on a regular basis because the demands change. So we, we have these discussions, organized discussions, um, every year with them. And then in addition to that, um, as I said, uh, we have these research programs that are ongoing with them. And so because of these relationships, it's very easy to also have interns work there. So the supervisors obviously also discuss with them so there's that constant interaction. And um, uh, the other thing is that we also have R&D of important companies, such as uh, Friesland Campina, I don't know whether you know it, in, I think in Nigeria it's called WAMCO. Um, so their R&D offices with 400 staff members is located on our campus. Next year, Unilever is going to relocate its R&D on food and agriculture also on our campus. We have American companies, we have Chinese companies, so even our campus is an ecosystem already where this golden triangle is working. Um, and what I want to emphasize what Prof is also saying, it's not only the knowledge that is important, it's the skills. So your teaching methodologies have to change. You cannot lecture in front of a thousand students. It doesn't work like that. So you have to adapt that also, so that these students show initiative. And my last point, lifelong learning. I graduated in 84. I, honestly, I mean, what I learned then is no longer very valid now. So we also offer short courses. It can be half a day for people from the private sector to be updated or uh, up to three week courses. So lifelong learning is very essential and that ensures also that we stay in touch with the future employers of our yeah. students. Thank right. you. Thank you very much for, for that clarification. Um, Tony, so I think somebody was asking you what's the model, intern or student? Sorry? Um, donc pour la personne qui a demandé quel est le profil type d'un stagiaire, en réalité je dirais qu'il n'y a pas de profil type d'un stagiaire parce que nos programmes de stage du moins sont basés sur euh, la demande. Mais ce qui fait qu'un stagiaire est plus compétitif qu'un autre, c'est qu'il faut savoir se vendre. Je pense que tous en sortant de l'école on a acquis certaines connaissances comme on, on est en train de le dire sur le panel, mais aussi savoir se vendre à l'employeur pour dire « je ne je, je, je viens pas seulement là parce que j'ai besoin d'apprendre, moi voici ce que je vous propose, voici des nouvelles façons de penser, voici ce que je peux faire pour vous ». Et ça, ça rend vraiment un stagiaire très attractif parce que l'employeur se dit « ah tiens, voilà quelqu'un qui va venir, qui peut nous apporter quelque chose, qui a une nouvelle manière de penser et qui va pouvoir contribuer ». La deuxième question que vous aviez posée, c'est par rapport à « qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour qu'un produit se vende ?». Um, je vais juste faire allusion à la chaîne de valeur dont on a parlé. Un, d'abord savoir euh, quel est le produit ou le service que vous essayez de vendre. Um, donc on passe de la recherche et développement, le premier maillon, euh, la production, le deuxième maillon, la transformation, euh, l'emballage, la distribution, le marketing. Um, mais réellement, ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est que d'abord, il faut développer un produit de manière qui est, ou un service qui est techniquement valable. Et ensuite, et ça franchement, je ne le redirai jamais, et je pense que c'est quelque chose qui, qui manque énormément, c'est qu'il faut valider ses hypothèses. Donc l'entrepreneur peut, peut être là en pensant que voilà, mon produit est bon, mais le marché vraiment ne s'intéresse pas. Et l'apprentissage, comme le disait madame, c'est tout au long de ce processus-là qu'il faut valider. N'attendez pas d'avoir un financement pour valider, parce qu'après vous vous rendez compte que petit à petit, on commence petit et on, et on grandit. Et à chaque étape, il faut valider est-ce que c'est vraiment un produit dont le marché a besoin et, et recevoir ce feedback-là. 
Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, Ellie, uh, any last parting words or in response? Thank you so much for that question. First of all, as I indicated, uh, we work from markets into production. So the contract farming is where we are contracting farmer groups or individual farmers with a, a document and with responsibility of each player in that value chain. And we provide or we link capacity to capacity building, we link to extension services because we have a good relationship. We've developed that network with our research institution in Zambia, our seed control and certification institute for quality assurance of our seed. And because at the end of the day, when we get this crop off the farmer at the end of the pyramid, which is grain, it will still need a phytosanitary certificate which will allow us to export it. So quality assurance along the value chain is quite critical. So for any farmer that comes to us through, they need to go through contract farming. Uh, outgrower is a loose end where you just go in the community and say, grow this crop and I will, I will buy it from you. There are no specific roles that they are going to play and they are not uh, given the right specifications that are like an example of production cost. How much will this farmer produce from one hectare? And how much seed rate do they need? And what packaging do they need? How do they manage the crop? How often should they weed the crop? So all those things go in the contract because at the end of the day, we need to ensure traceability as opposed to outgrower where we do not have uh, any loyalty from the farmer that they are going to show courtesy and take care of the commodity. And uh, the last uh, um, reactions come from uh, Michael. Uh, briefly, I think there were some direct questions, maybe coming from Kenya or about Kenya. Thank you. There were two questions um, from Nigeria and Ethiopia. Um, the one question which was asked about alternative ways to provide and disseminate information uh, related to GAP, we are developing a portal. Um, but I'll say this, and, and this is one of the design challenges that we've taken on, because to participate in the GAP program, there's a fee, and we move the gaps around, and the delegates, the participants are self-sponsored. That means that everyone who comes has to reach into their pocket, plan for it, and spend. And to the point that was mentioned by the gentleman, there are some who will say, but I've not tasted GAP. I don't want to waste my money. Um, but our thought was, you cannot be in business. And I started my first business at 27, um, and that was 20 plus years ago without investing in yourself, your knowledge, your contacts, et cetera. And unfortunately, on the continent, we have a lot of development programs. Um, and this is not a dig. If you can go without coming out of pocket, do so. But there are times when you need to be someplace. You need to be where the market is. You need to be where the funders are. And you have to pay for that. And I don't think we encourage, particularly our young people, and in some cases, women business people, because we say, no, we want to help them. It's that subsidy versus no subsidy discussion that we started our day with. It can cripple you. Um, so our whole focus is, I mean, we've invested to date $40,000 of our own money. We go out and look for partners. Partners say, well, it's a tough time right now. And we keep investing from our other businesses into this because we believe it has legs for the future. But we definitely, like I said, we're looking at country programs so that you don't have to travel outside of your country, and we're looking at a digital platform so that you can access the research. Right now, you could go to gap.biz and find the technical material that we used in the first two, which is for free, so it's there. Um, the other question, which was just effort, efforts to connect our delegates and participants to resources, a hallmark of the, the gap program is that Part of it is plenary like this, 
but another part of it is peer-to-peer -peer learning with mentors where you stand up and you use a whiteboard and you write down why am I here, what do I need, what am I trying to get out of this, what will I do over the next six months when I leave here. It's that last slide that we take a picture of and we send back to you and we will work with you on. And so if you say, I need lease financing, we have a network of lease financiers. So we'll work with you to make sure that what you present to the lease financiers is sound. You'll still have to sell it yourself, but at least we're using our reputation with the stakeholders who we work with to help the young people who we're working with get a foot in the door to present themselves. Now, we had from the first gap, for example, some people who didn't write us back at all. So we're not gonna chase them to help them. But those who've said, this is my plan of action, please work with me, we will definitely work with them. Okay. I hope that answers uh, both questions. Thank you, and uh, thank you all members of the panel for the time, for the responses. Thank you to members uh, um, of the audience who have posed questions and have been, uh, I think, uh, duly responded to. It's been my pleasure to, uh, and responsibility to moderate this panel, and I thank you all for your attention, and we give them all a last round of applause. Thank you. And I hand it over to Abim Bola, I believe it is. Thank you very much. That was the toughest uh, panel, because when you get to talk at the last panel of the day, well, we, I was pleasantly surprised by all the questions that were asked. Thank you very much to all the panelists. I, I was very intrigued by what um, was said about the capacity of Netherlands, and I quickly did a check and I think it's worth watching. It's just, um, it's under two minutes. Please just see it. Work, love, and eat. The Netherlands, a small country, one of the most densely populated areas in the world, and yet, the second largest food exporting country worldwide. A substantial part of the total economy and still growing. The numbers are impressive. And the regional impact huge. And produce from the Netherlands like seeds is highly appreciated. How can it be that such a small country is the second exporter worldwide? One of the secrets to success is Wageningen UR. The Wageningen campus is where government, science and business meet and turn knowledge into smart applications that improve the quality of life. Through the combination of fundamental and applied research, far-fetched ideas became reality, such as the energy-efficient greenhouses that use geothermal energy and solar heat. Technical, economic and social disciplines collaborate to find and develop more sustainable and animal-friendly systems. And new industries like the bio-based economy find their roots in Wageningen. You want to know more? Visit us at the campus or online. I think that's very impressive. We can achieve much more than that. We can. Africa is blessed with so much that, you know, a land with 7.1 million people and a campus of that nature, I think we can do the same. I just thought that would inspire you, taking from that statement. But there are so many statements that have been made today. We want you to go and dig further. Go on the internet, explore further, take it a step further, and that's how it will make a deep impression in you, and you can bring out something much more than what has been heard today. Tomorrow, we're starting again. Just before you leave, we have a few housekeeping um, announcements, but please, this is to inspire you. Success is possible, success exists in Africa, and we're celebrating that success. Nobody should go out of here complaining again 
that you know nothing is happening in my country. The more you talk about the corruption in your country, the more you are deflecting people from coming to invest in your country. I heard recently that oh, somebody was griping about how old oh, your country is the worst. What you are telling every other person is that don't come in here, including me, don't come and invest. Because what makes them feel that you are the exception? You're not the exception. Tell the stories, tell the successes, and we'll be able to attract that which is needed to make agripreneurship the hallmark of Africa's rising. We have um, Mr. Chantal Gagoske. Sorry, it's my glasses again. Gagos. You forgot a parcel in the Kedja um, IIT guest house. Please go to the IIT mail room building, 500 basement. Someone has graciously brought it here to Ibadan for you. We also have people traveling to Lagos on the 27th. Um, Dora would like you to make sure you catch one of the buses leaving early on Thursday, right? Wednesday. Maybe you should come and make that announcement. Okay, the ones traveling on the on Thursday, on the 27th, they flight before 12. They should be leaving uh, tomorrow to Lagos guest house to spend the night there. And then the day after, they will pick them to the airport. Okay. That's clear. So don't wait till Thursday morning just because of the dinner. It will be a fantastic dinner. You will be able to follow it with all the tweets that are going out. But please catch that bus and go to Lagos tomorrow, and you'll be able to fly out on Thursday. So everybody head for that superlative um, cocktail that is waiting for you. It's right in the building. You would see the tent and everything, and enjoy yourselves. Remember, network, network, network. Ask questions if you can't talk immediately about your business and it will happen for you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah.